We're here with Dr. Howard Foreman, Professor of Public Health Management and Economics, Director of the MBA MD program, Director of Healthcare Curriculum for MBA for Executives, and a practicing emergency trauma radiologist. Dr. Foreman, the last 24 hours have been quite dramatic in the Senate. Where, where does the bill stand now, and what can we expect in the next 24 hours or so? They often say there's two things you don't want to watch being made, and uh, one is sausage and the other is legislation. And this is sort of the reason why um, most of the legislative process usually proceeds by you know, regular order, starting off in, uh, with a single senator or congressman, proceeding to a committee and working its way to the floor of the Senate once you have all your ducks in a row, so to speak. In this case, we're, we're sort of watching most of the process out in the open with uh, no necessary um, confidence about what can or will pass. And so we're in a process right now where through various um, steps, the Senate is testing certain votes to see which senators will go for which aspects of which bills. Then it will move into a 20-hour period of debate. And what will follow that is what's called votorama, where uh, numerous amendments introduced with very, very short debate will occur over what may be uh, more than a 24-hour period. Um, and at the end of that process, a single bill will presumably be introduced uh, to replace the pending House bill, and that bill will get voted on. But before that happens, we will see other, other numerous votes occur. Um, and those votes will give us a sense for where the, the Senate stands on the matter. We, we don't know what exactly will, will come out of all this, but the various proposals that have been put forward over the last several months have numerous things in common. So there is, we can probably get an idea of generally how things will look. Um, what are the key ways that the bill will likely change the status quo? So, you know, there's several aspects to the bill that should either concern us or should give us some hope. Um, ideally, we would be seeing things that would strengthen the mandate, that would um, help ensure that insurance markets in the, in the states operate more efficiently and provide adequate assurances to insurance companies and state governors that both the exchanges and the Medicaid programs can function properly. Uh, I would say that for women, and uh, even men uh, being able to continue receiving funds and Planned Parenthood is also paramount importance to many, many people. And those are the things that are all in play right now. In, in terms of uh, the stakeholders, patients, doctors, hospitals, insurers, et cetera, how do we think that they will be impacted? Yeah, it, it's very difficult to imagine too many stakeholders that actually benefit from this. Clearly, there are some uh, non-poor individuals in the individual insurance market who, would, who are healthy and, and more often than not young who would benefit from this. And this is not inconsequential. This is a few million people, but it's a relatively small segment of the overall population. Healthcare providers, for the most part, you would expect to be worse off from a bill like this, whether you're hospitals, physicians, and so on. Those that receive tax cuts, like the medical device industry, even the pharmaceutical industry, um, and so on, might, and certainly certain rich individuals, uh, might benefit from this financially. Um, but this is, you know, up until very recently, this bill has been mostly a big tax cut financed by cuts in the Medicaid program. And the Medicaid program touches at least 70 million individuals in this country and more than 80 million over a two-year window. And uh, that is a large, you know, that's almost 25% of the population that is potentially harmed by uh, cuts to this bill, cuts in this bill. With any bill that comes out, the impact will not be uniform across the country. In terms of different states, what can we expect you know, in terms of the impact there? So certainly states that have expanded their Medicaid program, states that have uh, you know, more elderly individuals, states that have more high-cost health care to begin with, are states that will be worse off um, if this bill were to pass. 
Certainly states that rely on Planned Parenthood to provide primary care and, uh, and abortion services would be worse off. Uh, there are other states that I would say are less worse off. It's hard to imagine cutting $700 million from Medicaid that isn't going to hurt every state to some degree. It just varies how much each state is, is harmed by this. Um, to the extent that some of those states will have a more uh, you know, free market insurance program, some individuals in those states would be better off. Will there be uh, an urban-rural divide? You've been, there's been a lot said about that. So health care costs are higher in urban areas. They're more likely to have had Medicaid expansions uh, and so on. So uh, certainly urban areas will be considerably worse off than rural areas in the terms of the changes. But rural areas will also be you know, considerably worse off, um, partly because a lot of the rural areas are also lower income areas. And lower income individuals are much more likely to be eligible for Medicaid and therefore much likely to suffer cuts from Medicaid. So even though there is a divide in how they're impacted, they are both impacted negatively. So each version of, of, a, of a replacement bill that the CBO has scored has shown tens of millions of people losing access to their insurance. What implications for this system can you see of a flood of people suddenly becoming uninsured? So certainly the, the aggregate numbers that we're seeing right now are if there's no follow-on legislation. And the Republicans have promised and the White House has promised that they will have follow-on legislation. So the numbers we're seeing are the uppermost numbers without follow-on legislation. Uh, having said that, it takes a long time to pass legislation. And it's very unclear, given the mandate from Paul Ryan to basically cut dollars out of the health care budget, that you're going to have anywhere near the type of coverage we have right now. We're at actually historically high insurance rates in this country, even though a lot of people uh, you know, may not recognize that. We're at historically high insurance rates in the country. Um, Losing that many people from the insurance market means that, once again, providers will be provided, providing considerable amount of uncompensated care, that patients will lose access to primary health care and preventive health care, uh, and that overall we'll begin to see, once again, uh, many um, uninsurable individuals, those with pre-existing conditions, finding it difficult to access insurance markets. There is no guarantee that anything will come out of uh, the Senate that can be agreed upon but by 50 votes plus the, the vice president. If it fails this time round, first of all, do you think that's, that's the end of, of the attempts to repeal Obamacare? Care? And, and secondly, what can we expect from the administration in that case as they've been hostile to Obamacare from the beginning? You know, the president is a showman, so it's very difficult to know what his long-term strategy is, or even what he firmly believes in or not. But one thing is certain, the Republicans right now own health care in America. They may not have passed the Obamacare, but at some point you have to own the domestic agenda and you own your foreign policy agenda. You can't continue to blame a prior administration. You know, for a few months, for maybe six months, you can talk about the prior administration. At some point, particularly when you own all branches of government, or at least the, the executive and legislative branch, it is very difficult to deflect attention to something else. So the Republicans are going to have to address this one way or the other. And the a continued undermining of the, of the implementation and um, carrying out of the ACA uh, is going to have to stop because it, it is counter to the best interests of the people and, and so the Republicans as well. So as a physician, how do you view this issue? Is it a moral issue for you? It is really difficult to, um, to already contemplate that there are 30 plus million people in this country that do not have a legitimate uh, point of access for health care. Uh, they may or may not have access to federally qualified community health centers, uh, which will you know, have reduced cost. They may or may not have access to emergency rooms in many cases. They theoretically do, but it can bankrupt them, so they have less access than we would like them to have. 
Um, and from the point of view of healthcare in this country, it's in everybody's best interest for everybody to have access to healthcare. We have a recent outbreak in, uh, in Maine in, with uh, pertussis and I think either, either mumps or measles, I forget, but a recent outbreak of childhood diseases that are otherwise preventable. Some of that may be due to religious and other objections to getting vaccinated, but some of that may be due to the fact that people don't have an access point to health care and therefore don't get health care. We need every single individual to have access to health care in order to have preventive care, in order to protect the overall population, and from a social justice standpoint for us to be able to go to sleep at night believing that basic services are provided to everyone irrespective of their ability to pay. That's all the time we have. Thank you very much. Thanks very Thank much. It was fun.